Hello. Hello. You, you are, are listening, listening to, to the Carol Connection. Connection. With, With your, your host, host Jerry, Jerry Carol. Carol. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Carol Connection. I am your host, Jared Carroll, here to bring you guys another great episode. I did want to take a chance to shout out my last episode, episode 108, titled The Dog's Life. I did that episode in memory of my dog, Jenna, who passed away 14 years we had her, so I wanted to have an episode to kind of express all my feelings about her, the process, and kind of what a dog's love meant to me, and how kind of like it's the closest thing to unconditional love that we get to experience as people. So... It was one of my more vulnerable episodes, so I would appreciate if you guys tune in and check that out and get to really see into my personal life a little bit for once instead of um, an interview style. So I know some people like that type of episode from me, so I did that. You can check that out at thecarolconnection.simplecast.com. Also available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the major listening platforms. So today for episode 109, bringing in Sarah. Um, can you please pronounce your last name for me? I definitely struggled with this, so I didn't want to butcher it for anyone. Yeah, it's Sarah Schnevsky. It's a little hard. Yes, it was going to be very difficult for me to pro- uh, pronounce that, so I appreciate you doing that. Um, of course. For the audience, uh, just let everyone know who you are and kind of what you're doing currently. Yeah, so I am a rehab aide in a PT clinic, and I am going to school for PT. Perfect, and we will dive into your career and kind of how you wound up there mm-hmm. a little later in the podcast. So kind of like I mentioned off air. Um, I like to start off with family dynamic, and I say this, I'm pretty repetitive on the podcast. I know I've gotten some critiques about this, but I do it because I don't know who's listening for the first time, and I want to explain why I do what I do, because I do have new listeners since I have a new guest, so people are listening for you, might not know me, and I'm doing this so kind of lays the foundation for us, Mm -hmm. so people know where you come from. Your kind of like your background a little bit, and it, and we build on that and throughout the podcast, so we get a full picture. Because I'm not famous, mm-hmm. so it's like people might not know what's going on, and I try to just keep it blank slate, and we'll start from zero. So obviously, whatever you're comfortable with sharing, mm-hmm. I'll let you take the floor with that. Okay, awesome, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm Sarah, so I am a rehab aide. I went to school. At MCPHS in Boston. And pause you. Family dynamic. And we'll oh dive into it. Family yeah. dynamic. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Shit. Good. You're good. Because <laughs> we, could, we could go that way, but I want to yes. methodically build there. Family okay. dynamic. We'll Let's start see. there. <laughs> I'm a middle child. Um, so I have a 27 going on 28 year old sister. And then I have a 14 year old brother. So we're all seven and a half years apart, which is great. It's very fun. Um, I live at home currently, unfortunately. I will be moving out soon to Worcester, which is very, very happy about that. Um, And I have a dog. His name is Max, and he's a German Shepherd. And I live with my parents, obviously. (laughs) And for you guys know I've talked about this. I live with my parents as well. Yes. And your parents are still together? Yeah. Yeah. And I love hearing that, especially as someone whose parents are together as well, Um, because it's the foundational pieces of, like, childhood is having good parents that teach good values. And yeah. I'm not saying a single parent can't or grandparents care, none of that. But I mean, when you look at a lot of these studies that they produce, <clears throat> typically a lot, the success rate for children, especially when you get to school and career is there when they have both parents present yeah. in the household. And I mean, it's, it's just the facts. And I think it's always interesting to kind of hear that perspective because I'm not like, I'm not a psychologist or anything, <laughs> but like I look at it to see, cause a lot of our influences as adults stems from our childhood Mm -hmm. and what we were taught growing up. So I always find it super interesting. And the age gap too, was that, was that you think it was your parents planned that? Like, well, that's kind of interesting. Literally no idea. My mom says that it wasn't planned, but to be completely honest, I don't know how in one's life can have it to be seven and a half years and not be planned. So (laughs) I literally don't know. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that my brother was not supposed to be, <laughs> but they decided against it. But again, literally no idea how it was. Seven it usually and happens years. to the younger children. Right? <laughs> sorry, no, sorry to my brother. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like- <laughs> sorry to the younger children. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being offensive, but facts are facts. <laughs> but with um, that age gap, so did it help you too? Because I have an older brother as well. Does mm-hmm. it help? 
And I, I, for me, it was helpful having an older sibling to look up to and kind of get some guidance from. Did you ever have that experience? And you could say no if it's yeah. that. Well, okay. So my first 16 years <laughs> of my life, my sister hated me. Like full out would write poems about like, oh, wow. hating me. <laughs> Respect. Yeah, I know, right? It's very dedicated. Um, but yeah, so at first it was really hard for me and my sister to get along. I think when I was younger... It was just because I was the youngest. I was getting the attention and she was like, what the hell? You know, like you kind of suck. So, um, but up until 16, my sister, like we were not, we didn't get along. Like we once got in trouble. I think it was me or her got in trouble and I had to stay in her room like to sleep over. And I was like, why, (laughs) why is that? You know, why is that a punishment? But it happened. So I think. After I turned 16, I kind of like was more mature and definitely evened myself out with everything going on. So then then it was good to look up to her and kind of see how she was doing and what she was doing in life and everything she did, I guess. Yeah, I'd actually say the my relationship with my brother Jordan was very similar growing up. Mm-hmm. Like we used to just fucking fight. Yeah. Like we just fist fight. Like it was not literally fun. my cousin <laughs> We go to my cousins and we start fighting and my cousins were running crying. They're fighting again. Oh like, my God. like we just like, for lack of a better term, we just fucking hate each other's yeah, guts. Like exactly. it was just competitive and just brotherly. And like, this was like, it was just like, that's what boys do. And yeah. like, and like, it was the stereotypical of that. And like, yep. my brother is not the, I'm a very expressive person. Mm-hmm. And you've experienced that <laughs> even off the podcast, a lot of stuff that I was talking about. I'm very expressive. And my brother's polar opposite. Doesn't say much, doesn't mm-hmm. talk much. He's cool with just doing what he does. Yeah. And we're very different. But as we grew up, we matured. And yeah. like I think there was just like a mutual respect where it's like, and I've said this before, but especially for all my brothers, my oldest and my two younger, mm-hmm. if anyone ever did anything to them or said anything to them, I would do anything oh, to yeah. protect my brothers. Oh, yeah. And I think that is something that is valuable about having siblings is having those positive relationships. If you're able to, obviously sometimes family can be toxic. I'm not going to say that it can't, but with us growing up and being so close in age, like we did everything together. And like he was someone that I always like fought with, but he was my best friend at the same time. Mm -hmm. And as I got older, I really realized that. And just like being at home now, like obviously we're older, so we are looking at like like yourself. We are looking to move out and start our lives and keep mm-hmm. progressing. So, like, I've been trying to be more appreciative of the time that I ha- I'm able to spend with like my family, my like my brothers, because there's probably never going to be another time in my life. Maybe when like my parents get older, if yeah. that, that we're going to be living in the same house together. And yeah. it sucks. It's like weird yeah. to think about, but it's also like, oh, it's kind of good. But at the same time, you're like, oh, this is kind of sad, you know? Like, yeah, it's, it's, it, you can't, as I think with age, you do get introspective in general. Oh, yeah. And obviously, like I told you, like, and you've probably seen like my dog pass. So, like, mm-hmm. she was my family straight yeah. up. That was my family. And losing her and like any death, really, it makes you think about life differently. Mm-hmm. And, that was like a closing of a chapter almost like yeah. from 12 to 26, I had that dog. So I literally grew up with my dog and now I'm literally about to be 27 this year looking at the landscape <clears throat> and society is like all over the place right now. So like the housing market's crazy. Interest rates are sky high. Ridiculous. And like, it just sucks being millennial and Gen <laughs> Zers because when our parents were younger, like, you can move out, start a family on like a 50 K salary and yep. like be fine. Yep. That's just not possible anymore. Like <laughs> it's, it's just not, it sucks. No. And the way everything's happening, like it's very, makes me very filled with a lot of anxiety and yeah. like, I'm nervous about where things are. And obviously I was talking off a podcast about a lot of my personal life and mm-hmm. how this is kind of a little bit tied into that and stemming it all the way back, kind of making the full circle, just being appreciative of my brothers too. Yeah. Because, even though we don't talk like every day, we're not very communicative or that might not be the right word, but we don't talk a lot. Um, we do play like our video games together. And I realize that's our quality time. Like yeah. I've looked more into like love languages and how you love people and how they receive love. Yeah. And I'm a big person on quality time. Mm-hmm. And I've realized that he kind of is too. He's not the words of affirmation. He's not going to say, I love you a lot. <laughs> and like my dad's not like that, but I am. Yeah. And I've had to learn how to like love people differently, especially in my family. And I think that's a process of part, a process of growing up. And I think that's really great that you brought that up. Cause I can actually relate to you in that <laughs> aspect with, with siblings. Yeah. But 
I want to steer this a little bit into kind of like childhood, like maybe some of the hobbies or sports that you played growing up. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. You, I'll let you kind of take the, the wheels <laughs> yeah. with this. Cause I'm not too sure uh, <laughs> what you did. So. Um, well, so as a kid, my sister also, so she did swimming and she ended up going to, you know, a solid amount of swim classes. So I started to follow in through that. Um, I was a very athletic child, which is kind of shocking because now I'm completely the opposite, which sucks. But um, we both used to be on the swim team. So I think that was our quality time that we did spend together, which was really nice. Um, So I did swim until I was about, oh God, I have to say like 12 or 13. I also did ice skating and tennis. I did so many different things that just it's crazy to think about that I was actually doing them, but now um, I after swim I took like a break for I think a couple years, and I competitively swam like all the time. It was just kind of like my thing, um, but I ended up breaking my shoulder right before high school, and I had to get surgery. So I was out of swim and out of everything else that I really wanted to do, um, which kind of definitely was sad. <laughs> But it gave me a lot of time to kind of like focus on myself and better myself and mentally and just physically and kind of figure out how to go through that. Um, But then I got onto the varsity volleyball team in high school, but my doctor didn't clear me to play. So, (laughs) yeah, it's not fun. No. But yeah, so it's hard because I also have um, EDS. It's Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome where my joints and my connective tissue is very loose and flexible. How did you find that out? Like, how does one figure that out? So I think we had to do like a genetic testing because... I was just breaking things like all the time. Like my wrists were like twice a year and it was just ridiculous. So I think my mom found out she had it. So she was like, why don't we just test you? And then my brother has it. My sister has it. She's popped both of her shoulders out of her socket. So it's like she can do it automatically. It's weird. Um, So I get we had to do like a family testing and all of us have it, which is really, really quite unique. But it's not fun. <laughs> so past genetically then, most likely. Yeah. Damn. It That's sucks. Crazy. So like you, you, you were getting injured a lot basically when you're playing a lot of the sports too. Yeah. I mean, so most of it was just because of swim. The other time I was also very clumsy. Like I fell and I broke my wrist, which I shouldn't typically happen if you're just falling forward flat. Yeah, you should be able to brace it. It shouldn't yeah. just like give like that. Yeah. It, no, it just like snapped. <laughs> so I don't, yeah, it's, it's not fun. My How did that weigh on you like you mentally? Like that's a lot. It's honestly, it sucks because it's kind of like you want to do a lot of things. Like my sister loved ice skating and then she broke her foot ice skating because of it. And so she kind of stopped and like I stopped swimming and swimming was one of my like go-to like if I was stressed like anything any issues that I had I would go swim and that was like competitively swimming was like a way to get my anger out or just like teenage hormones was just I needed to go swim um so not having that like output of being able to I guess competitively do sports it kind of took me back a little bit because I needed to figure out how to just without doing sports mentally kind of try to figure out which ways to go about what I needed to feel and feel it out, (laughs) I guess. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a little hard, but in the end, I mean, I think I figured out a way anyway, so I still do some things, but (laughs) yeah, I I can imagine too, being an athletic person, like that's, that's, it's going to be hard when you're dealing with so many injuries, like, yeah. It definitely wait because I know a lot of people who have and I've, people who've come on the podcast who suffered a lot of injuries and like it weighs on you mentally whether it's yeah. like depression, uh, depression or anxiety. It's like because it forces you to look at other avenues, especially young in your life. Like obviously, when we're young, sports are kind of like our everything. Yeah. Like especially being competitive people who are athlete, athletes. Like I always talk about football. Football mm-hmm. was everything to me. So if luckily I w- I never had injuries. Like I'm That's so thankful. Awesome. <laughs> Like, jealous. I had small stuff like you get banged up. I yeah. had broken ribs here and there, but like it was never like never any diagnosed concussions, but I can guarantee yeah. that I've had a few. Like <laughs> definitely like, off the books. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like there's some stuff just like get back in there. Cause like I grew up in the 
Well, they just started making the switch in helmets where the yeah. helmets were like, used to be this, old, I mean, you could go back in time and see all the fucking like bars oh and fucking God. old ass helmets yeah. and like, you get fucking dinged up and it was just like, suck it up. Like, yep. and I was just like, all right, like, I'm cool. Like, <laughs> I'm like, like, like there's a bunch of these colors, but like, I, I'm good. <laughs> like, so like that part was like difficult to grow up in. And then yeah. like when sports are removed, that's when I felt some of my low points early on in my yeah. life because that was my identity essentially and like when you took away sports and i don't know if maybe you felt similar with these injuries like where it kind of forced you introspectively yeah because it takes everything away you're kind of like you put your everything into one thing and if you get that taken away you're kind of like shit (laughs) where am i going now (laughs) like what do i do so yeah i totally i completely understand with that yeah and it's it's just a lot so swim was like your primary so would you say that was like your primary sport that was i was on a team I was swimming competitively like every single day, like doing um, competitions every single uh, every weekend. Like it was intense. I even went to um, I went to camp for a while and I would we had this thing called Maccabi. It was where we do a lot of sports. So I was always playing soccer, volleyball, um, tug of war, <laughs> which I probably shouldn't have done with my shoulders. But yeah. <laughs> I did anyways. I was like, you know what? Screw you. I'm doing it. And we would win. <laughs> and then I swam for the same team like in Maccabi. And that was where I broke my shoulder. It was Literally, I still got first place because I just heard a pop and a crack. And I was like, this is weird, but I'm just going to keep swimming. So I did. And I still got first place, which I still have that ribbon because that will be like my highest moment of my life is like I broke my shoulder and I swam a competition. I still won, you know, (laughs) like really cool. But it was in the end kind of getting all of that like diagnosis and all that. It was just kind of like very world shattering (laughs) to me. But it ended up being okay, I guess. <laughs> yeah, was it because your sister was doing it at first? Is that the like was that the first reason like that you kind of got into swimming? I think so. I think we just like my parents wanted us to do sports and not just like hang out at home, you know. Yeah. So I was like, I'll do swimming, you know. Like I like water. I like going to the beach, and then I ended up being like really well <laughs> at competitive swimming. So we both were on a team. My um brother hates it, like despises swimming, and I'm just like, dude. <laughs> why was he dragged to a bunch of meets maybe growing up honestly potentially i, I don't <laughs> that even that could be remember, fair then that could be fair then yeah so i don't i don't blame him but yeah he's it's a difficult sport it's very it competitive is, it is oh my gosh but it's so fun because you get so much like reward out of it too which i never thought i would say in my entire life because like swimming you know <laughs> but you do get so much like once you win you kind of get like the cheering and like the um what's the word i'm looking for the um oh my gosh maybe admiration maybe i don't something know it might like be the, my, i know it might be not the exact word but something like that it, but it's, you, it's kind of somewhat tension too it's yeah. like the eyes are on you and like yes. you're succeeding and like the success of winning oh like gosh. this word is gonna piss me off i know it starts with an a um oh my god okay i'm just gonna keep talking maybe it'll come back okay but it's um you just have a lot like you you know that you're almost there, kind of like at the swim meet. You're halfway there and you can hear the people like going and going. And you're like, okay, I need to make it. Like I need to get there. So it's it's so much like pressure, but it's also like in the end, like you're like, wow, that was worth literally all of the sweat <laughs> that went through in the, in the pool. <laughs> so it's like, it's a big thing, but yeah. It's, it's a great sport and like yeah. it keeps you in hella shape. Oh like swim gosh. is like very physically demanding. Yeah. And, like, to have the breath work and everything too. Like, I mean, applaud to, I don't know if I had too many swimmers that I can recall off the top of my head on this podcast. So it's always interesting to get a little bit of an insight into a sport like that Mm -hmm. because a lot of the time the sport doesn't get many eyes until it's like the Olympics and things like that. Yeah, exactly. So like that's when people start paying attention, but I know a lot of swimmers and it it was something that was very big at, um, at Seekonk that we had a lot of great swimmers and divers as well. So like, Mm -hmm. I definitely like hearing about that. I want to take a turn into kind of like, the kind of reasons looking at you. So you're going to like your senior year, you're getting, you're mm-hmm. gearing up for college, trying to paint the picture. There's always a bunch of different options on the table. Yeah. Why school? Why go to school? Well, my sister went to college and honestly, it was my parents. They were all like, you know, you need to get a degree because you need to work. You need to make money, yada, yada, all that stuff that every kid goes through. Um, I knew 
Well, so in high school, I knew that I really wanted a lot of things and I needed to pay for it somehow. So I was like, I should probably start working, get a job, kind of figure out what I need, what I want in life, you know, stuff like that. So I ended up going, they pushed me towards the same school that my sister went to because they were familiar with the process. I think that that's their reason. They wanted me to literally do the exact same thing that she did. So they put me, well, I applied to the MCPHS in Boston. I wanted to go for something in the scientific, like medical field, but I didn't know exactly what it was. So They were like, why don't you just do PA, which is physician assistant. That's what my sister is. I was like, you know, I don't really think I'm like up for it. Like, I don't think I have the like ability to become a surgical PA and like do surgeries like blood taking blood out for me. I pass out. I'm done. (laughs) Like, I need to lay down. It's not good. But I did it because, you know, I figured I'll make my parents happy and just kind of go with the flow and do what I needed to do. So I went for the PA track. I got in, which is kind of shocking. It's really easy to stay, to get in, but it's very hard to stay in, which is unfortunate. But, um, so I went there my first semester, I got sick. (laughs) So already (laughs) off the bat, I was out for like a month. I didn't know I could take a leave of absence and not like get um, crit- not critiqued. Um, I not think get, it, like, is it like a withdrawal or something? Yeah. So yeah. you could like literally a month, I could have just gotten passed for my classes and just been like, okay, like she was sick. She doesn't need to do them, but I was still doing them even though I was like dying <laughs> for a month, which is not fun. Um, and then COVID hit and that was when I had to go home and it was my second semester of my freshman year, which was just awful. It was terrible. So I wasn't focused on actually learning. I was focused on making sure that my GPA was above and beyond where it needed to be because I had a scholarship. So I was not interested in any of my classes. And I was like, this is boring. Like I can't, I'm not doing it for just the grades, you know, like I want to learn something. So I had a whole identity crisis and I was like literally in the middle of COVID I was like I'm not doing what I want to do what do I do how do I figure this out where am I going am I in the right school um I ended up switching to PT which thank god I did I was in between PT and vet I don't know why I didn't want to see any animals being hurt but this is just not who I wanted to be but I wanted to help so those were my two choices um so yeah, I switched into PT and I that was probably like the best decision that I have ever made in my entire life <laughs> because if I didn't, I probably would have either flunked out or dropped out and just I don't even know what I would have done at that point. So So when you made the switch, yeah. Is would you say maybe part of the reason too is that you wanted to like help people? Yeah, so I've always wanted to um be like in the medical field and kind of always help out and I've always liked like having a relationship with people, but I figured out for a PA, it was kind of like a one and done. Like you see them, you treat them, you get surgery, goodbye. That was kind of, I didn't like that. Like I wanted to actually follow through with people and kind of make a relationship throughout working, which is like not something you hear a lot of because usually it's kind of like you don't make a relationship with your clients or it's you do, but it's nothing too like intense, I guess. So I honestly have to say that because like PT, you kind of see them at one point and you see them up until the finish line and when they graduate, so to say, um, that was kind of like my main point of wanting to follow through with someone and kind of see their, um, the way that they progress throughout like, I don't know, let's say eight months. Like you see a person change, you can see them go from their lowest to their highest or they fluctuate, they can get better or worse, but you're still consistent with them. So they're always there. F- they're, you're always there for them. So that's what I really liked about it was that you, I guess me, <laughs> I have the ability to follow through and see patients and kind of get them from point A to point Z. And that's kind of what I really liked about it. And I really like, <clears throat> excuse me, that the fact that you want to do these things, you want to yeah. help people, because I don't think people do that enough in general. Switch the camera for us. <laughs> um, yeah, people don't do that enough in general. Like they, they kind of go into certain fields a lot of the time for selfish reasons. They, yeah. they like, oh, it I, makes money or something like that. It's yeah, kind of like, and like, do you even want to help people? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm the first one to admit it. I went in for strictly money purposes, yep. and because there's sometimes that I battled 
with not choosing psychology. Yeah. And uh, because I think originally I was going for criminal justice. Hmm. And I was going to, I thought law enforcement, I was actually going to go into the Navy after high school. Whoa. (laughs) Yeah. And that didn't pan out. So I went to school. Mm Mm-hmm. And I had no idea what the fuck I was doing because my plan yep. was Navy. That when that didn't work out, I was kind of just so I guess I'll go to school and yeah. tried law enforcement or criminal justice, thinking that because I wanted to do uh, I was going to be like a Navy like military police officer. That was what mm-hmm. the job that I'd signed up for. And when I did law enforcement, and then I was kind of taking the class. I'm like, it just didn't pan out with the Navy. Why the fuck would I do this yeah. now? Like this doesn't <laughs> even make sense. And then at the time. It was when uh, a lot of stuff was happening in Baltimore at the time Mm -hmm. and like things were going very chaotic towards police officers. Obviously now it's like very heightened even more. But I saw that and I was like, do I really want to work a job where I have a like a bullseye on my back? Right. And I was like, ultimately, no, I don't think this is the career that I wanted. And when I looked at the landscape, I mean, the typical thing for a lot of people is business was make money and go to business. And I was like okay, I, I I guess. And then I was like looking around, like, I don't want to just get a fucking like a random ass, like management degree. Like yeah. uh, I don't need a degree to tell me that I can manage people. I think that, <laughs> sorry for anyone that has management <laughs> degrees. I know people in my life that have them. No disrespect. But I looked at it and when I saw accounting and I started taking some classes in business, one of the first one was like accounting 101. They explained it as the language of business mm-hmm. and it made sense. I've always been good with numbers. I was always good at math. Yeah, I was like, this can make sense. I like logic. I like reason. I like answers. I like getting a legit answer. Yeah. I mean, hence a lot of the stuff we were talking about <laughs> the podcast, but I like having legit answers to things. And when I was going down these paths, I knew it would be, lead to a career that was sustainable and would have money. Yeah. Cause you don't want to go into something that's like, doesn't make money. Yeah. yeah you gotta right? be, it's, it's like that weird paradigm, like becoming an adult where it's like, everyone's like, follow your passion. Yep. What if your passion doesn't make money? Right. And it's like then you can't do a lot of what you need and want to do. It's, it's exactly rough. like and like I wish people would kind of caveat what they say. It's like obviously we're young and this is the time to pursue your dreams. But they also don't talk about just real life. Like mm-hmm. we gotta be realistic at some point. I hate being like it sounds pessimistic to no, say yeah. these things, but it's just the fact. It's like for people who don't have health insurance, like if you're chasing your passion and you get sick or something major happens, you're going to be in deep trouble. Like, yep. especially nowadays, financial bills or medical bills are very expensive. Like anything in hospital. Exactly. Like ambulance rides, anything like oh that. Like it's, it's super expensive. I mean, and that's to bring up the fact that you got injured a lot, but I mean, yeah. I mean, you've probably <laughs> seen a lot of like hospital rooms or getting, whether it's x-rays or MRIs. Like, yeah, it is ridiculously expensive. It's like not, I mean, it is necessary expenses, but at the same time, like being the person having to pay that is like why is this necessary (laughs) like seriously but it's it's there's pros and cons it's like yes expensive but also not necessary (laughs) it's like like glad i have this but damn this costs a lot like exactly and it's like like, it's like first world problems like i get it but like i don't think people think about these things when they're choosing career paths in school they don't they don't think about because you I like the what you did. Where you chose kind of the like kind of like the best of both worlds, where you can make a good financial career for yourself, but yeah. you could also help people. Yeah, and I think that's fulfilling. And I think people don't look at that aspect because if you're going to choose a career like myself, and I'm the first to say it, you're going to. If you don't want, if you don't like numbers, do not do <laughs> accounting. Do not do it. Yeah. I personally like numbers. I'm good with math. I've always liked numbers. And if you don't like it, don't do it. But if you're going to get into a career like this where it, like, it leads to some type of like office job, and it's not always just business. There's a lot yeah. of jobs that are office jobs. If you're going to do that, it's going to lead to a monotonous lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And if you aren't going to do things outside of your job that aren't fulfilling you, you're going to get depressed. Yeah. And I found myself in that way. Mm-hmm. And I've talked about this multiple times in the podcast. When I first moved away, I moved away to Texas and Georgia. And... The first thing that like hit my mind is like after I'm going through the day to day is like I'm not providing any value to like life and people like I'm yeah. working and like there's value there obviously but I'm not and doing like, anything doing the same thing over and over with no like other thing to do you know yeah it, it becomes monotonous yep. and dry and boredom seeks in <laughs> and that's when people get depressed yep and people don't look towards that part of like picking careers yeah. 
And that's why, like, I definitely got to give you your props for that. I, I want to, I'm curious to know, since obviously COVID was like a major part mm-hmm. of, are you still in school currently? Yeah. So, so like, I'm yeah. going into graduate school in okay. September. Well, good for you. That's, Thank you. That's, that's very <laughs> impressive. Um, with COVID happening, how did that completely shift the way you looked at school and how you, you go about your, like your schooling? Honestly, at first I was going to take a gap year after COVID hit like that semester. I was like, okay, I'm probably going to take a year to like not be in school. Cause I don't, I hate it online. It was like, you just, you don't see anyone. You don't talk to anyone. It was like zoom call. Yeah, sure. I see my screen, but I can also see my screen and like read a paper. Like it's, it was nothing. It was just boring. And I was like sitting in my room every single day from like this time to this time doing my work. I was like, this is, this sucks. Like I was going to bed at like 4 (laughs) a.m. It was just not a schedule that was, that I could actually do something with. So I definitely, I really wanted to take a year off, but my parents were like, you just need to get through it. Like if you don't get through it, you're going to take a year off. It's not going to be a year. It's going to be two. It's going to be three. You're not, you're never going to want to come back home. I mean, regardless, I didn't anyways, Um, but it kind of really, I just didn't want to do anything. I wanted to kind of just work, even though I couldn't, I didn't have a degree in (laughs) literally anything. So it kind of sucked, but I ended up being able to work um, this summer or actually the school year for like regular school, um, high middle school and an elementary school, I babysat. So while I was babysitting, I was doing work in like first school, which I think have, if I wasn't able to babysit, I would go absolutely crazy because it's just sitting in a house and you're doing just one thing. And yeah, I had zoom calls and stuff like that, but it was like, I'm still working and doing work. So I still kind of had I was, it was still COVID, like shit was going on. It was rough, but I was still making money and going to school, which is is exactly what I needed to do. Because if not, I was kind of like, I'm going to go crazy. This is sucks, you know? (laughs) Yeah. It's always interesting to hear hear people's like perspective while in school when COVID's happening. Yeah. Because I was out of school. So like that, I know school was already difficult for me Mm -hmm. when I was doing it. Um, I'm not someone who loves school, I, so yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fan of it. <clears throat> and I actually personally liked online classes when I, before mm-hmm. COVID because like it, I didn't have to go to class, yeah. and, like, I could just do it all online and stay home. So I was kind of like, yay for that. Yay. <laughs> yeah. But I think it does affect a lot of people negatively. Yeah, definitely. And especially, I could imagine with the type of um, field that you're getting into, like being hands on in oh your classroom is probably very important. So like, yeah. how was that? I literally had chemistry labs where it was online and you would press to put on your lab coat. Like you would literally press, put on lab coat, glasses, I mean, goggles and um, like whatever else you needed for the lab. It was like, why? why? Like it, it was like, put, I don't know, put whatever in a tube. And I literally would click and drag and put in the number of how many milliliters, let's say needed to go in a tube. And I was just like, this is, this is ass. <laughs> I can't do it. Like it was so bad. I had to take, um, I had to retake a couple classes this summer and one of them was a chemistry lab and it was literally like photo document yourself performing the lab experiment on your computer. So I would literally sit there and take a selfie of me doing the lab report on my computer. It was so stupid. (laughs) It was like, I don't even know. It was just so bad. I don't really need chemistry in PT, which is thank God I'm over and done with it because I would cry. But it's like anatomy you need anatomy lab. What we were doing in my anatomy lab where we were sitting there, she gave us a packet and we'd fill out what each bone was without even like getting. That's like high school stuff. Right. What the hell? My high school teacher, thank God for him. He made us do practicals. And I was like, this was like senior year. So I was like, why am I doing practicals in high school? But thank absolute every single atom in that man that he made us do practicals because we would stand around and take a test and we'd have 30 seconds to identify a bone and where it goes in and where it comes out. Like if I hadn't done that, I would be fucked. <laughs> like <laughs> no It's a lot of information. Asked. Yeah. And it's like, how do you do it on a paper? Like really? <laughs> so I stopped going. I was like, I'm, I can't do this. And it was optional. So you didn't even have to go in and 
submit the lab report. It was just optional, which makes absolutely no sense. But have you noticed school, has it gotten easier since like it's gone online? No. So it's gotten harder. Yes. I'm such a hands-on person that like, so I have to say it's gotten harder, but I had an internship last year. And that made it go easier because I was actually hands-on with patients and, like, learning. Whereas in school, here's a paper, read it, answer these questions, you're done. You know, it wasn't like – I wasn't getting tested at my internship, and now I don't get tested at work. I mean, I do. Sometimes the PTs will be like, hey, I have a question. What is this and this? And then I'll actually answer it correctly, which is, oh, my goodness. But it's like hands-on is so much more important, especially in the medical field. Like, you can't – you can't get a degree online if you're in the medical field. I just feel like it's hard. It's like you are ju- you won't be the best that you can be, so to speak, if that makes sense. No, it makes a ton of sense. <laughs> I always say the the most that I've actually ever learned was always on job experience. Yeah. Even in accounting, like you could show me a bunch of like how you do the financial statements, the assets and liabilities, like the balance sheet, all these different aspects of the financial like bookkeeping but I really don't learn it. So I'm doing the business. Like the business part of it is where you learn. Yeah. So like, I would totally agree with you. And like, I always say that to people is like, well, this is different than, than your field, at least from my field. I don't even think you need a degree to do half that stuff. (laughs) Everything I ever learned was on my job. Yeah. Like did it, the basics, like, like the one oh ones, the one oh twos, the very early classes teach me a lot. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. But a lot, and especially, it's more when you work for bigger companies that have great documentation, that have all these things outlined for you, they're going to teach you. They're yep. going to teach you what you need to do and how you need to do it. Unfortunately, it's just a piece of paper that gets you in the door. Exactly. And, and it's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <that> yeah. Too. <laughs> and like, because it, it, realistically, the pe- piece of paper kind of signifies connections, which mm-hmm. is like something that I've always kind of like harped on was like making valuable connections with people. Because your connections and your network are what kind of carry you through life. Yep. If you treat people like shit, you're, you're going gonna, nowhere. You're going nowhere. You're going to live a shitty life. Yep. So it's like, I love like the saying too, it's like when you surround yourself with like the five closest people are going to define who you are. Mm-hmm. And like, I've been trying to take that a little bit more personally when I like go about my life and especially within my work life is if you hang around with people who are only doing degenerate shit. You're going to end up doing degenerate shit. You're going you're gonna to be a degenerate too. So it's like trying to surround yourself with like educated people. And it, like, I hate using this word because I don't mean it this way, but people who are better than yourself. No. Yeah. Cause they'll rate, they'll get you to that point where they are like, they'll help you lift you up and you will be there at one point. <laughs> yeah. Cause like you, you need someone who knows more than you to teach you something. Cause mm-hmm. if you surround yourself with people who all know the same thing, like no one's going to learn from each other yeah. because like. And that's why I love this podcast because, like, you live a totally different life than I do. Mm -hmm. And every single guest that has ever been on has always lived a different life, which is important because I'm learning something new almost every single week about someone. Yeah. And I think that's the coolest aspect. And I don't think a lot of people take the time to do Mm -hmm. because – one, it's uncomfortable, like putting yourself out there. And I always give everyone oh, yeah. like you're getting a ton of credit for coming on this podcast. Like <laughs> I appreciate you for being vulnerable and like we're talking about your life, talking about the things that you've gone through and what mm-hmm. you're doing and like the visions that you have for yourself. It's not easy to do this. Yeah. Like like I always give people mad credit because like we got lights, we got camera, <laughs> like it's all like a lot's happening here. And yeah. like if you're not used to it, it's nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I can imagine when you first, when I first hit the record button, like you started <laughs> to get like, a little, shit. <laughs> literally <You> pressed it. <laughs> like everyone, as soon as I do it, like, I'm just like, it's another day. Like, it's just yeah. like, it's, it's so normal to me that being behind a microphone is how I feel comfortable. Yeah. And I can imagine too, in your work life, the more that you work with patients, the more comfortable you get with being with patients. Yeah. And I'm curious too, like obviously without going over like your company lines, but mm-hmm. the, your confident confidentiality with people um what are kind of some of these things that you've learned like actually getting into this workforce honestly a lot of it is just comfortability with patients is that's i would have to say like yeah it's your confidence in what you're able to perform and like what you're able to do but a lot of it is being comfortable performing those tasks so like I used to think that I was like nothing. Truly, I did not think that I was doing any help other than restacking towels and anything else that needed to be restocked. But now it's kind of, I've 
I've been there for enough time to actually be comfortable to like have conversations and kind of see how patients are doing versus how they were before. And now I can not say like not put my hands on them because I can't do any manual work, but I can be close to them and like guard them, so to speak. So if like if a patient's a fall risk, then I can be next to them and kind of protect them where they're most vulnerable. And I'm able to perform that activity with confidence, which is kind of you see like from the beginning, if I were to go back, you would see such a big improvement of like my abilities of speaking to patients or calling a patient and asking them their availability, like really small things as that versus bigger things like following through with a patient's like treatment plan and actually thinking of different um, exercises for them to do to strengthen what they need. Like it has gotten so much better because before I was like, I'm just going to sit here in the corner and look at you guys do, do everything. And then just wait until you need me to restock something, you know, like I used to be like, I was very shy and like not confident at all of my abilities, but now I'm like taking initiative. Like if a patient's there, PT's eating lunch, I'll be like, okay, like, let's go. Well, I'll take you through these things. And like, they're always grateful that I'm doing that because it kind of gets the patient started. But I used to, I would, I would never do that. <laughs> like a year ago, I would not, not even close. <laughs> I think that's really awesome because like, I'm someone who actually went to PT mm -hmm. and like I went, I had um, tendonitis in my knee. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I didn't think it was going to work at first. <laughs> and like, I was like nervous too. And I'm like, oh, just physical therapy. They're not yeah. going to do anything. But like, <clears throat> They would literally, like, it's, like, such, I'm, like, very big into fitness, so, mm -hmm. like, they would walk me through these, like, sh like lighter exercises, like, is this really going to do anything? Yeah. And it's, like, they know the body so well that, that you have to train these specific muscles around the knee, which strengthen it, which take yep. off, like, the inflammation, and it's, like, it's stuff that, like, I didn't even, like, think of, and, like, that's why I would say like what you're doing is super valuable because people don't know and like people don't have the the knowledge to be honest yeah. of the body to to put themselves in. Sometimes they don't even have the discipline to put themselves in. Yeah. So to have someone like yourself to also make them feel comfortable. I think that's a perfect word to to describe what you do and like how you help people because I think I try to do the same thing with this podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I even said it, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, before like we like really started it was like, I try to make my guests feel comfortable before we record and we spend, yeah. you know, we spend like a little over an hour just like talking. <laughs> it's like, I was talking Shoot about a lot shit. of my, <laughs> talking about a lot of my drama, but it's like trying to like make my guests feel like this is a safe space so yeah. they can feel comfortable to express everything that they want to express, to mm -hmm. say whatever they want to say. Cause we live in a climate where everyone walks on eggshells. No one everyone wants to. Everyone is so, so sensitive right now. It's everyone wants so to the wrong bad. Thing. It's so bad. And like, <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to create a platform where it's obviously my topic is centered around mental health. Yeah. But you could say whatever the fuck you want to say. Exactly. Like, I don't want people to like, oh, I can't say this. He might get offended or someone might get <laughs> offended. Like, you know what? I feel my feelings, yeah. but I'm not going to put my feelings on other people. Fuck what other people have to say exactly. about what you want to say. If you're saying obviously things that are like purposely like, rude purpo don't, yeah i mean don't. Like, you don't be an <laughs> asshole like i think that is like not the best thing to do but when you're in those situations you do have to take accountability for yeah. stuff like i i mean i was telling you a lot of the stuff that i've been through and it requires you to be self-aware and honest mm -hmm. like that's I'm, a big thing like i'm not always a nice person i'm an asshole sometimes <laughs> like i can be toxic and like that is something that therapy taught me is to like call myself out on my bullshit yeah. like i'm not a perfect person like i'm i would be lying to like everyone that listens, if like I portrayed myself that way, yeah, and then like I'm not like it's hard to hold yourself accountable. Yeah, That's, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, and it goes back to the comfortability aspect too that we've been talking about. Is like the only way to be comfortable is to get uncomfortable. Exactly, put and, yourself in situations that you wouldn't want to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and I think that is like a huge proponent with like starting new careers or mm -hmm. starting new ventures, whatever they may be. Is like it is scary. You yeah. don't know what's gonna happen, and like. I remember every time I went to do an internship somewhere and like, I was like so fucking scared that yep. I was going to do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing and look stupid. Yeah. But like, 
You need to make a mistake in order to get better. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that would probably be something that I actually quote for the podcast. That might be the quote for the podcast. But like, I, I really believe that because like the only, and, the, and this applies to everything, not only just work, but like whether you're doing like some social media content, whether it's a family relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship, whether it's a friendship, mistakes are going to happen. Yeah. Things are going to be said that are not always the best. Things are going to be done that are not always the best. And that goes with everything that happens in life. It's how you bounce back and how you adjust to those things. Because if you always harp on the negative and you always harp on what happened, then you never really grow. You're not grow. going anywhere. Yeah, you stay stagnant and yep. the things are never going to really change. Because like, we're always changing as people. Like, I'm not who I was a year ago and I can imagine you could say the same for yourself. Oh, yes. <laughs> so like, it always requires a ton of growth on the individual and some people choose not to grow. Yeah. And like I always say, what I preach and what I say might not be for everyone. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, that's okay. I'm not for everyone. And like, that's something coming into social media that I had to really learn and accept and grow with because. Not everyone's going to want to watch. Yeah. Do you think, <laughs> like, you think your friends and family would care and tune yeah. in, but like realistically, those are not the people that are going to care and tune in. It's the people that kind of rock with your so-called yeah. tribe that really kind of gravitate towards you. And I mean, I do got one of the people in house. Shout out Mike Braga chilling on the couch <laughs> over there. Appreciate you. Been on the podcast twice and you guys are together and yes. like I, he's definitely part of the reason I was able to get you on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And I definitely appreciate, and he said a lot of great things too on podcasts about you. And like, we've talked a little bit about relationships and stuff because I always have personally struggled <laughs> with relationships these past couple, my whole life, <laughs> my whole life. But like a lot of the stuff that like I see from, I always look at other people who have at least I'm not going to judge other people's relationships with people who look like they're happy and doing things yeah. well. And you guys look like you're happy and doing things well. Thanks. Obviously relationships <laughs> are always up and down and you don't yeah. post uh, the private stuff, but a lot, and like, I'm interested to know too. And obviously whatever you're comfortable with sharing, mm -hmm. <clears throat> cause like dating apps are such a unique proponent of dating nowadays. Yeah. And when Mike came on, he talked about how you guys met on a dating app. Mm -hmm. um, from your perspective, especially being a woman in today, like how do you view dating apps like in the current climate? Honestly, I have to say that at first I did not like them just because I was like, all right, all guys want sex. That's it. Like I've been, my father, <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> has instilled that in me is like all a, a guy father. will ever want is sex. And so I really couldn't even like see myself going anywhere with anyone because I was like, he's just going to want to take advantage. This is just what's going to happen. Like, I can't do that. I need someone who's like stable. I need to end up having children and a husband. Like I can't, I'm not someone to fuck around like at all. Um, so I think it was, I was just like over it at that point. I was over relationships. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to say, fuck it. I'll just get Bumble. I didn't want to do Tinder because I knew. Yeah, no, it's oh the place God. where people go to die. Like yeah, that literally. is like the worst place like, to be. Do you want to not have a good time? Go on Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> Fact, that's the app. Sponsor me. <laughs> um, but so I just learned about Bumble. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or I think I looked like dating apps up just because I was intrigued, you know? So I got it just for funsies, whatever. I didn't really think anything was going to come out of it because I was, well, I'm 21. So I was 18, 19. I was like, no one's going to want anything. All they're going to want is sex. That's all. That was point blank. Didn't expect to go anywhere with anyone, not even a conversation, even though I had to initiate it. So a lot of the times I was like, oh, he's just going to want sex. I wouldn't even say hi, you know, <laughs> like, there's no reason to. Um, but yeah, it was kind of, it was different because I had to initiate conversations, which is like not something that I'm, I'm very not social. Like it's hard for me to introvert. be social. Yes. I'm a very big introvert. So I was definitely a little nervous, but you know, Bumble gives you like little, little questions for you to ask. And I was like, I'll just press one and send it, you know, like might as well. Why not? So I think the first one was like, oh my God, it was like, what is your favorite quality about someone or something along those lines? And Michael over there said work ethic. And so that was, we actually started having like a genuine conversation from the beginning, which ended up me saying like, I'm for, he asked me where I was from. I was like, I'm 45 minutes away. I'm in Sharon. I don't think you're ever going to want to come drive out that far because again, 
who is going to want to drive 45 minutes to an hour for sex? You know, that was my only thing. I was like, he's just going to want it. Like, there's no reason that didn't happen. He drove and we went on a date into Olive Garden and it was great. It was like one of the best dates that I'd ever had, to be completely honest, in my whole life. Because it was just, it was very raw. It was like very, like, so much truth and honesty and it was very just open which I really appreciated because I'm not some I'm very open I'm brutally honest and people don't like that so I was glad that he was able to kind of like take my shit and I took his shit so yeah I I personally love brutal honesty and I mean shout out Mike's been fucking fantastic these lights that you guys don't see off camera I said it on his podcast it's are because of him he lit the fire under my ass was like it's too damn dark in here with the lights in the ceiling I was like shit so like shout out to him but like he has talked positively, like I said on on the podcast about it. And like, from a guy's perspective, like, I mean, well, one, your your dad's right. Like, I'm <laughs> like he is. Like, Thanks. like he is. Like, like as a man, like generally speaking, yeah. men want sex, and yeah. like that is the unflattering unfl- reality about dating. Is we want to sugarcoat stuff and we want to pretend like these things aren't really happening, but like they are, and we want to. Level the playing field with dating. Mm-hmm. But like I've said it on multiple podcasts, men and women are just different. Yeah. We look for different things. We want different things mm-hmm. and we react to different things. Obviously each individual is going to be different, but when you categorize in like, I'm obviously speaking just between um, heterosexual relationships, yeah. but like between men and women, mm-hmm. like we're, there's certain things that we're going to be attracted to in, in the opposite gender. Yeah, And I don't think people really truly want to accept the biological truths of that, which is fine. Like, it, I, like, cause I always say if people want to say gender is there's a bunch of different genders, that's fine. But there's two sexes then yeah. like we have to get at some point, there has to be a, a common ground that we could all agree on. Cause if there's not, then like, we're, it's just we're, gonna, it's gonna go everywhere. It's gonna go everywhere. Cause like you could be whoever you want to be. You can identify yeah. as whoever you want to be. And I will identify you as that. I have no problem with that. I just don't agree with, saying that there aren't two sexes or yeah. like if you want to say there's multiple genders fine but sex is like men and women like they're yep. just it's just biology <laughs> like i mean i don't know if anyone took it in high school but apparently <laughs> nowadays they don't and it's just like i get the idea of accepting people and yeah. i'm all for that definitely but not at the cost of just truth like it's just like we can't coddle people's feelings so much where people can just be fucking cats and dogs like yeah, i'm just right? like there has to be a line at some point but like I just wanted to get your opinion on on that aspect of dating because I thought it really rang truth for a lot of stuff that I'm going personally in my life. It's just mm-hmm. like dating is kind of a struggle in 2022. People are struggling with dating apps and like there are positive relationships that come from dating apps. Yeah. Like they're not often, but they do happen. <laughs> like I know I have a handful of people that have had really great relationships and I've had people on the podcast that I actually met off Tinder. So like, oh, wow. like you can meet genuine people on yeah. these apps. It's just- you have to not f- try and find them. <laughs> then, then that's when they'll come. <laughs> that too. And just, I think being honest, like you said, yeah. like once you're honest, people are more willing to respect it. Even if they don't, you don't want what, what each other wants. But if you're honest, both that's parties can make a decision. Both yeah. parties can make a decision on how it goes. And I think that's the best. Yeah. I want to start bringing this home with this podcast. Um, I do have one more question for you. Is there anything that you wanted to say before I get to my last question? No, I think we've covered it all. <laughs> Perfect. So, Sarah, for my last question. Yes. Uh, what would your advice be to someone who wants to pursue their passion? I would say do it and do not give a fuck about what anyone else says. Because as long as you are happy, that's really all that matters. Um, a lot of the time, I did not have any confidence that I was going to get into grad school. Or, like, I, I wasn't one of the kids that was, like, doing extracurricular activities. So I didn't think I was outstanding. So you can do the bare minimum and still be outstanding. That is like my top, top knowledge for anyone is that you can literally just get through school and do whatever you want to do to become whoever you want to be. And you can be outstanding no matter what. That's perfect. (laughs) Thank you for coming on this podcast. I really appreciate uh, the vulnerability, the openness, the honesty. Mm -hmm. I think it makes for a great podcast. And I always appreciate anyone that could sit across from me and have a conversation. (laughs) So thank you. Thanks. I had a lot of fun. For you guys, if you guys like the podcast, please rate, review, subscribe, share with your friends, share with your family, share with your grandma. You can check it out at thecowconnection.simplecast.com. Also available Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the major listening platforms, and even on YouTube. So peace.